What is up, football fans? This is the Live from the 55 podcast. I am Danny Austin. We are broadcasting live from our beautiful Marta Loop studios here with the Nation Network in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, we are in the middle of a street festival. Mardi Gras, I believe it's called, just outside. So a bit of a crazy day getting here. Parking was not easy. I know that's what you guys are here for, listening to me talk about parking. But excited to be here. We got a big show. I do have Ian Busby popping in. He's going to talk about what, what honestly, crazy weekend in the CFL. But I'll argue that a, a crazier week here if you follow the Calgary Stampeders. And we're, we're going to have to talk about that. Um, we're going to have to talk a lot about that. You know, we try to make these Sunday shows a bit of a, a sort of CFL wrap up. And we're going to do that. We have to. Um, but there's really nowhere else for me to start other than the Stampeders just getting completely trampled by the BC Lions. It is, I've been covering this team since 2016. It's what six seasons, I think, because of the missed 2020 season. So, season six, season seven, that that was the worst uh, beatdown that I have seen them receive. So, you know, we're going to have to start there. But, you know, I, I definitely want to talk about the Riders and the Alouettes, which I think, you know, the Alouettes won, but I think that's a bigger win for the Alouettes than it is a, a bad loss for the Riders. I just think with a short week, um, I'm just not willing to put too much stock in it. Now, Riders have problems. They're not a perfect team. I'm not going to say that, but, you know, I'm just not. If I'm a Riders fan right now, I'm looking at that loss. That's a schedule loss. It happens. It's tough, but it happens. And, you know, we'll get to that in a bit. But, we're, of course, we're also going to talk about the Bombers, who, who came back from 22 points down against the Edmonton Elks. What does that mean? I don't know. It's the Elks. Uh, at 22 nothing. they're sort of watching. And I, I laughed. I was like, this is this is not enough for me to feel confident. The Bombers are too good a team, and the Elks just, you know, haven't found, figured out how to win. That's what it comes down to. But I saw a lot of nice things that I liked from Trey Ford there. So, you know, that's a game that I think we got to talk about. And I'm being real with you. I've always, since the start of the Stampeder season, sort of said, okay, well, stay, try to stay within striking distance. But you got those two Labor Day back to backs with Edmonton that, you know, should be guaranteed wins. They'll help you jump across or jump above. Sorry, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders there. Third place, it'll be sort of there for the taking. Man, <laughs> the way the Stamps played and the way the, the Elks played, I'm not sure you can guarantee that those are wins. I, I still suspect they are. I still think the Stamps are a better team. Uh, but that I was encouraged, to put it plainly. I, I was asked about that on, on 770 before yesterday's Stamps game. You know, Jock Wilson was sort of like, how bad can this get for the Elks? And I thought, you know what, that was a step forward. That's my own opinion. Uh also, I do want to at some point. We're going to have to talk about Nathan Rourke. I know he's down there in the NFL, but seeing him against the Cowboys yesterday and, and, and seeing Patrick Mahomes tweet about it, Warren Sharp, you know, all these huge names tweet about this play where he kind of busted through, what, four Cowboys defensive linemen, something like that, and just fire a bullet right into the end zone. You know, it's just cool seeing a guy who, who we saw got to do that last year with the Lions here in the CFL. I think that it's exciting, the possibility of a Canadian – being a quarterback in the NFL, we know he's not going to be starting, but you know, that was cool. We see so many CFL guys go down there and not get given a shot. And that's the type of thing that I don't think you can turn away from. You know, he got a shot, he rose to the occasion. You'd love to see it. But look, uh, I'm quite decided how long I'm going to go on this intro because we do have Busby, and Busby obviously has a ton of experience covering the Stampeders, predates me by a long way. So that may be a little bit more stamps heavy than we normally go on Sundays, anyways. But you know, I, I, I got to talk about it because, look, 37 to 9, just the scoreline alone is so brutal. And it, to be honest, it's not like the Stampeders have an excuse for this one. It's not like the Riders where you can say, oh, well, we played five days before and had to fly across the country. Like, they were not on a short week. They played at home in Calgary last weekend. You know, they, I spent the entire winter flying back and forth to Vancouver. Um, and, it's not that hard. It's not that hard on the body. So uh, there's just not really an excuse for coming out as flat as they did. And it's not just that they came out flat. They came out making mistakes, you know, um, offside on the opening kickoff. You can't do that. Penalty after penalty after penalty. I could keep going. Um, I think it added up in the end to something like, I can pull it up. So I'm going to do that. Yeah, it added up to 12 penalties for 140 yards. You just can't do that. You can't do that against bad teams, let alone a good team like the Lions, and there were so many holding penalties. The whole thing, it was just tough to watch. And, you know, I think Ryan Ballantyne, regular guest here, did a great job on 3 Down Nation talking about how, you know, these little these little screen passes, when they're at sometimes first and 20, I, they're just not working. You know, we, we've seen 
so many drives. And I've been hesitant to kind of talk about that because I, I'm, I've got no business talking about play calling. Who am I? Right. Um, but I get that there's probably a little bit of a lack of confidence with this offense right now to, to go downfield and to go over the top and, and to really push. And, but, these short little dink and dunk passes they're, they're not working, whether it's the blocking, whether it's a, whether it's just become too predictable, whether team know teams know it's coming. It, it's not getting them anywhere close to the yards that they need. And honestly, I, it, it's boring to watch. So you don't even have the advantage of it being exciting. Um, and I don't know how much of that's on Jake Mayer, how much of that is on Mark Mueller. I, I, I don't know how much of that is on anybody to be perfectly honest with you, but I, I thought Ryan, I, I've got to give him a lot of credit for bringing it up because um, I, I often veer away in my coverage from anything that is questioning play calling just because I don't I, I don't feel it's necessarily my right, but that was bad. I mean, another play call that did get a lot of attention was sort of, I believe it was late in the third quarter. The Stamps had a, a third and two, and they opted to sort of go to shotgun and, and, and go for a quick little pass from Mayer when you know, we've seen them have so much success on short yardage plays, just giving the ball to Tommy Stevens. And there are plenty of people, and I don't blame them, who are going to say, well, why didn't you just give the ball to Kadeem Carrier or Diedrich Mills? You got those guys. Well, like Tommy Stevens was hurt. He was experiencing really bad back spasms. So that's why he wasn't in. That's why he didn't replace Jake late in the game. They went with Chris Reynolds, the third stringer. Um, so it's a little bit harder for me to you know, put the blame on that, um, on, on the play call. And I was... I think people need to chill out on that one a little bit. It's one of the things that I've gotten a lot of feedback over the last 24 hours, and I just don't think it's necessarily accurate. Um, and like, I mean, this is just a game where the St. Peter's was straight up bad, and I do think that I'm not going to not give credit to the Lions. That is a good team. I know that they got crushed by Winnipeg. Again, they had a short week, um, and maybe that had people forgetting that they were they were this good, but Vernon Adams was incredible. I used to say, you know, firing absolute laser beams right down the middle of the field to guys who were open, um, probably more than you'd like, but those were some nice passes too. Uh, Vernon Adams was absolutely on his game and when he escaped the pocket, he he just looked so confident under pressure. And, you know, you almost felt when he was rolling out and he had a D line sort of chasing him, you know, almost felt oh, he's better here. Uh, and he is, he's just, honestly, I, I think I saw Farhan, who was our guest last week, Farhan Laudry from TSN, referred to him as the third best quarterback in the league he's definitely in that conversation if not higher um what Vernon did last night that was that was something special and of course like Keon Hatcher you know he looked like the best receiver in the league I'm not saying he is but he looked like it last night and then on on defense you know that D-line was getting a ton of sacks uh they were collapsing on or they sorry they didn't get a ton of sacks I should say I'm kind of like looking at my notes here a little bit uh they did not get a ton of sacks but they had Mayer under constant pressure uh the I I did not think that the Stamps O line was particularly good or effective at all um i think that there were too many holding penalties but the, the d-line like you got matthew betts you got, you got so much talent on that line and i do think that they look they they dictated the game and it was just domination um that's the reality so i, I do want to give the lions credit but you know as much as the lions were good i, I do think the stamps were equally bad and you know uh there are no cameras so we can't pull up the clip but i, I i've interviewed dave dickinson after a lot of wins and a lot of losses over my years uh, and I did, I was at the media availability this morning at McMahon Stadium. And, you know, with the obvious exception of sort of playoff losses and obviously the 2016 and 2017 great cup, I mean, this was the most, I don't know if dejected is the right word, but discouraged um, that, I, that I've seen Dave Dickinson. That's, that's anecdotal. Um, but that was my interpretation. It just looks like they need to find solutions and, and they acknowledge that they might not have them. Like, I'll just read you this quote. Um, again, cameras weren't there, so I've got to read it, but he, he said, you know, the playbooks there, we're just not executing it. We're the ones making a ton of mistakes. Penalties are one thing, but we did have some mental errors, critical mental errors. It was the whole group. It really was running back was probably the one position that played to a higher standard than the rest. And then I would say linebacker and D line played a solid game, but the rest of it, no, not good enough. And I, I think that's the, that's the pretty decent summation, right? The stampeders were just not good enough. They did not come looking like they were prepared. They did not come looking like they were ready for the fight. And that was from the first snap to the last. And I honestly have not seen them look that bad. And there's a part of me that does. I, I think that we talk about confidence way too much in sports. It, it often is just about execution, but that did not look like a confident group out there. Um, they did not look like a team that thought that they could win. And I don't get it. I, I think that there's a lot of talent on this team. I, I get it. 
you know, what's Reggie Bagleton going to do when teams know that they can focus in on him? You know, the other weapons aren't sort of taking attention. There were dropped passes. There were, you know, routes that were run wrong. Um, Jake was not at his best. The offensive line did not provide the protection, and they took too many penalties. The D-line was, was much better in the second half. I don't know that I thought that they were exceptional in the first half. I, I haven't rewatched it with that completely in mind, but it's hard. You know, I, I do think that the interior guys did a nice job, and they're getting so much attention, and you know, Mike Rosen and Derek Wigan, full credit to them. But I, I don't know that we saw necessarily a ton of pressure coming from the outside there. Mike Alway had some nice uh, had some nice moments for sure. Cam Judge is Cam Judge. He's as good a weak side linebacker as there is in the league. So you're not going to like really focus on those guys. But I, I like Jonathan Moxie also had back spasms. He was out. That's a vital player uh, for the Stampeders team. But it's hard. I, I didn't think that the the DBs did a great job. You, you can't. I mean. Running through for 322 yards and didn't play the end of the game. Um, you let Keon Hatcher get 170 yards. I don't know that there's anything that you can take from that game and feel encouraged about. And the reality is these St. Peters now have the Bombers this weekend on Friday. That's you know, it's not a super short week, but it's a short week. You're not getting all your preparations in, so you're not going to see them reinvent what they do, reinvent the wheel. And then they got the Argos in Toronto next weekend. Um, those are before the two Liberty games with Edmonton. Those are tough games. I think that the Stampeders team still is going to have something to say about the way that this season goes. I, I think that there's, as I said, there's a lot of talent there. There's a lot of smart people in the coaching room. But last night wasn't it. And, you know, you're trying to chase down a Saskatchewan team that is without their starting quarterback has also had a ton of injuries. And the Stamps have had a ton of injuries. I, I, I do think we need to acknowledge that. But it that wasn't good enough. I don't know that I ever expected them to win this game, but it was discouraging. I'm sure it was much more discouraging for, for fans who are emotionally invested. For me, it's just I like covering uh, competitive games, and we didn't get a competitive game last night. So, anyways, we're going to have to break that down more with Busby. For anyone who's not sort of a Stampeders specific fan, we I, I do honestly appreciate you. I'm trying to make this not just the Stamps podcast, but it's hard not to focus on it, especially when we had – a game like we did yesterday. So I, I've gone on probably longer than I normally like to hear. Uh, again, we're going to talk Riders, Alouettes. We're going to talk Bombers um, and Elks. And uh, hey, you know, if you're wondering what time we're recording here, well, the Ottawa Red Blacks are up 3 nothing on the Toronto Argonauts right now. Very, very early in the first. So let's get to Ian Busby. No one just wants to hear me talk. Let's have a conversation here. Guys, uh, thank you so much for listening. We we really do appreciate you. And uh, yeah, here we go. Let's get Buzz on. Guys, let's say you're having a party. Let's say you're having a picnic. Let's say you're having any occasion. We got to talk to you about Fraser and Fig. I love these guys. Here in Martin Loop, a couple storefronts down from our studio here. Fraser and Fig, man, these guys do these delicious elevated cheese and charcuterie boxes. You know, they're made with all these fresh artisanal ingredients, on-demand grazing, pickup, delivery. You got it. Just let them know what you want. They will get it to you. Honestly, I'm such a big fan. I had a picnic a little while ago. I brought one of their curated boxes, and it was a huge hit. I looked great. People loved it. We're hungry. They weren't hungry anymore. These ready-to-go boxes, they got them in four sizes. All their boxes come with meat, cheese, dried fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, and carrots. Their selections vary from month to month. Choices are always new. You know, Just because they've had one doesn't mean you've had them all. I love Fraser and Fig. I love having them as a sponsor. They're the best. Make sure you check them out. Tell them by from the 55 cent you. All right, as promised, we have Ian Busby straight from your job. You drove here, you got through the festival. Um, we, I made have... it, I parked, I'm happy, everything's it's, good. <laughs> I, again, like I, I, I joked in the intro, I don't think people are super interested in our Where you know, we actually list, record this? But yeah. the entire weekend, we were like, oh, well, it wasn't that extensive, but no. I was basically trying to come up with a strategy for how to park here. And here we are. Uh, we made, we it. made it. It wasn't that big a deal. No. That's what it comes down to. Right. Uh, Ian, I know you watched, you know, you watched the Winnipeg Edmonton game closely. We're obviously going to talk more about Stamps Lions, although my intro was long on that. So we're going to kind of go into the other stuff first. But honestly, I have been watching Canadian players take their shot. No, CFL players take their shot yes. at the NFL and never really feeling like they get that opportunity. I, I watched Jameer Thurman go down there. I watched Trey Roberson. I watched all these guys go down. And because of politics, they just don't get a great shot. Yes. Nathan Rourke comes in yesterday. I, I, on the odd chance that you're not a hardcore CFL fan, 
Canadian kid, played <laughs> ball in the States, came up, was an absolute stud, best player in the league. If he hadn't been injured, injured would have been MOP last year as the quarterback for the BC Lions. Big deal that he's a Canadian quarterback. Yeah. He was on pace to set multiple records for yardage. And he was incredible last year. It was un unbelievable what he did in just a half a season with the BC Lions and then comes back for the playoffs, wasn't 100%. Yes. Uh, still wins a playoff game, beats the Calgary St. Peters. So he signs. He goes down to the NFL. For the Jacksonville Jaguars, which ultimately the Jacksonville Jaguars, with Trevor Lawrence, have a starting quarterback. So there were people questioning or would even be the third stringer. He gets in in the second half last year. Last night. Yeah. The numbers don't matter. What really matters is he ran for a touchdown and then had one of the coolest like <laughs> quarterback highlights you're, you're ever going to see. Breaks through four Cowboys defensive linemen who are all over him and somehow finds the balance and whips a just absolute perfect pass <laughs> right in for the touchdown. It was, it was beauty to see. And all these years that I've like covered the CFL and I've always gone and people say, oh, NFL is just infinitely better and it's like it's not infinitely better no there's a there's a margin of like the top players in the league you know maybe the 100 and 150 best nfl players are yes way out of the cfl league but the majority of the other guys are really close and nathan rourke might be one of those guys who could eventually be one of those top 100 players in the league that's the thing he and came I, in what cam wake really was yes cam yeah. wake is the big success story i mean before that jeff garcia there's lots of guys yeah. who, if you go back far enough yeah yes again but outside of the quarterback position has been very many but the the, the what nathan work we expected you know him to do well down there and i think when he signed with the jacksonville jaguars it was a strategic move because he knows the number one guy right so they weren't going to go out and draft quarterbacks they weren't going to go and sign a bunch of free agents they weren't going to try and like it's they signed him for a decent amount of money and now he's getting a shot and you can see it's just it's just exciting when when it goes down and it translates that and quickly it, right it, you know it's exciting for us who who follow the cfl closely i am a believer that if you are a cfl fan or media or just lover of the league we got to root for these guys when they go down to the nfl because there's money there that you just yeah. aren't, aren't going to get up here and it's life-changing and it will change its generational wealth yeah. that you make down there so obviously root for them but i i do think that a lot of us are, are more invested in nathan work than we are even in other players because he's a canadian quarterback and that's a really big deal and we have waited for this sort of canadian quarterback right. for, well, uh, for generations and i love how where we've dropped the whole canadian quarterback thing right it was like every headline last year was like canadian quarterback like he's just the quarterback well, part of like, that and, is that the nfl announcers are so focused on the fact that he spent like three days as a receiver at a mini camp in, <laughs> i don't know if you, they keep calling him quarterback farhan can't like can't believe it he's like guys stop saying he's a quarterback turned receiver turned back to quarterback he just like it was three days of the minicamp he is a quarterback <laughs> but it's i don't know it's just so exciting and honestly i i have no idea i i genuinely believe that if given an opportunity eventually nathan rourke could be a a valuable starting quarterback yeah. in the nfl i'm also a big believer that quarterback in particular more than maybe any other job in sports uh, a, a year of seasoning, a year as a backup, even a third stringer. Absolutely, you're just learning. I think it helps. It is such a difficult position, and and the chain and the difference between the larger CFL field and the smaller NFL field, regardless of whether he played football yeah. in the states in college, is just significant enough that I want him to have the best chance to succeed. And I do believe it'll be as a backup yeah. to start. But this may earn him that backup role instead I think, of the third stringer. I think it does, and what it does is like, yeah, that play was amazing. But you just you see the athleticism, the poise. The calmness and the strength, man, that took a lot of strength to do what he did. Freaking Patrick and, Mahomes was tweeting about it, right? Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> <laughs> which is awesome, right? Yeah. So, and what I think is the it's great for the CFL that this has happened because we get, you know, it was bad for the league and everybody's like, oh, we finally got a good, great, another great quarterback and he's gone. Well, you know what? It's when not he, bad for the league. If he, if he gets, once he gets in in a regular season game, they're going to have a bunch of this BC Lions tape. Yep. You know, like it's, it'll be sitting there and i know producers of these shows they are of, of broadcast they have multiple things like hey if this is if this becomes a storyline we're going to need yep. to pull up especially his, in the nfl yeah we're going to need to pull up his like his cfl highlights so you put together they must have a highlight reel of his cfl stuff already just play him beating the stampeders 41 to 40 there you go <laughs> um, <laughs> that one was a beauty <laughs> exactly I, well he had a lot of beauty. nathan yeah. I know, special so player it, it's it, cool for it, canadian it, football it's great it's perfect it's it's awesome and i'm glad that the rest of the league is talking about it and now like you don't wish anything bad on trevor lawrence you don't hope this is his only highlight this year but 
if it is his only highlight, he's still putting up enough that. And he's going to learn behind Trevor Lawrence, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, there's good coaching there in Jacksonville. I, I'm honestly, it's just a positive news story. And given yeah. the, my t- intro, which was literally me just being like, oh, this is terrible. Uh, I want to, <laughs> uh, we'll get, we'll get to that. I want to start with something uh, positive. Yeah. We're actually going to, as I said, you know, we, we do a little bit of planning here. And I did say to Ian, like, let's hold off on the Snapes talk. Um, right. Until a little bit later, just because I don't want fans from other markets of which we do actually have some, we do yeah. have, um, I, I don't want them sort of turning it off. Let me do what a natural segue by me. Danny, you're getting good at this. Oh, wow. Uh, All right. Speaking of Canadian (laughs) quarterbacks. Do it without (laughs) congratulating yourself while Um, doing it. (laughs) Speaking of Canadian quarterbacks, uh, I know you watched the Edmonton Bombers game. Trey Ford was starting uh, for Edmonton. Ultimately, this ends up with a 38-29 to win for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Uh, But the Elks, you know, came out firing 22 nothing uh trey ford like they didn't ask him to do it done he was handing off the ball a lot it was a conservative right. game plan well i we, tweeted we, right before the game and i'm not going to go back and find it right now unfortunately because i don't have it up but i tweeted i was like definitely not going to happen but the funniest possible right, thing here is exactly. for the is for the elks to win and then like instantly it was, it was like 21 nothing yeah, yeah 22 nothing. i gotta quit twitter um <laughs> so right before the game i was like i actually messaged a couple of bomber fan friends and i was like Something I just have a weird feeling about the Elks tonight, and then it was yeah. like all the big plays at the start. You know, the first play from scrimmage I think was a sixty-five yard touchdown or whatever. It, it was like boom, boom. And it was like okay, and you know, one of them tweeted or messaged me back and said, "Is this the weird feeling you had?" And I, I guess so. I'm like, but what a premonition. Yeah, and it, but the, once they got out to that lead, man, did they mess it up? They just had to keep so- their foot on the gas. And it <laughs> was like, okay, it is Winnipeg. They were, their defense did tighten up. They filled yeah. up those holes. They suddenly weren't being the, – there was gaping holes in Work. their defense for the first quarter of that game, and then they, they fixed it. And, and uh, that's what Winnipeg cr- does. Credit, right? that's credit Winnipeg teams. for figuring it out. They were, they were not doing their gap control. They weren't fig- – like there was just wide open spaces for uh, the running back I, to get going there. And I can't remember. I will say that in a way that the stamps were down 17, nothing after the first quarter. And I was yeah. like, oh, this game's done at 22, nothing. Oh yeah. I was like, oh, this is, this, this is not over. Yeah. This isn't enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to get to what happened with, with Zach Kolaros, Um, But I, well, I, I it's another, wanna, another bad week for quarterback well, injuries. It's and just, I want to put that to the side just for a second and sort of focus on Edmonton a little bit, because there's the negative, which is you gave up a 22, nothing lead. And then there's the positive, which is look, for a team that was shut out a week earlier, yeah, um, that has been shut out twice this season, there were signs of life there. Yes. You get up to a 22 nothing. If we are looking for progress, and I am, because I just, Edmonton being as bad as they have been is bad for everybody. It's bad yes. for football. It's bad for the league. I've said this many times. So I'm looking for progress. I saw it. I think with Trey Ford in there, the, 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 I saw something there again. He was not asked to do a ton, mm-hmm. but... I'm sorry, you got up to, I th- and I think that is you a good scored first 22 step. unanswered yeah. points against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I respect what you did. It is not just automatically a failure in no. my book that you lost. And I liked what he did, uh, like rushing the ball. Obviously, he's like that's his strength. But now you can push it a little bit further every game from there on out. I think they just have to roll with him and see how it goes. He's going to give you your best chance to win right now. And why not? A year ago, we were all talking about, okay, well, he'll be the backup. Like, you know, he'll... Yeah. Um, Trevor Harris started, I believe, last season as the starter in Edmonton. Am I wrong? About oh, that was that? two years ago. Two years ago? Yeah. Uh, I wish we could edit that out. And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> it was like, don't. I don't even know who started as the starter last year. I think he was one of the guys that was out of the gate. Didn't he start out no, of the I gate? I know he was hurt? playing against Calgary. I wish we could pull this up. Um, <laughs> I remember him getting like starting early in the season and then getting hurt, but and then missing a bunch of games. Yeah, I mean, we, but I know I don't think that he started week one. I just know that Calgary went no. there and he had played the previous game and he got hurt in the game against Calgary. Right. Um. So look, this is terrible podcasting. No, well, um, but here's the thing. Either like, way, he was expected from what we to be the future. Yeah. He was expected to be the guy who they were going to develop up. Yeah. And and have him take over, whether that was last season or this season or even next season. Quarterbacks but, take a while. Same thing we just said about Nathan the Rourke. Future is now for a team that's 0-9. Right? Exactly. So, so I expect them to roll with him. I think it'd be crazy not to. 12-16, 189, one touchdown, one interception. It's like, honestly, I mean, what are we going to say? There's a lot of quarterbacks putting up a lot worse numbers than that. Yeah, he on, didn't throw a lot. On the other so. side, before we get to, to Zach, I mean, you've got Drew Brown in there, 17-24 for 307, right. four touchdowns. I mean, we've seen guys come in and be hot right off the bat, but that was a 
Yeah. That was an exceptional performance. And, and I called into so, a, a tough situation. <laughs> right. They get up 22, nothing on what looked like a, a like a, a sack instead of a, like a touchdown. It turned out it was very much uh, just a, a play there where Zach's trying too much to try and keep this play going and going and going. The Edmonton Elks had a lot of pressure on Zach that entire first quarter. And once they, you know, question whether the hit was dirty or not, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you can say that because it's so hard to be. I want to get into that. Yeah. I don't know if he like had malicious intent there. He definitely was like, Hey, the quarterback's still trying to make a play. I still have to do my job. Right. It's tough. It's a tough position to be in for a, a defensive player. But when, when you're, you, you go down 22, nothing. And then suddenly your t- t- quarterback is hurt. You that's where I, I was like, okay, this was quite the odd t- timing to have it. Um, this comeback start. So it was, um, you said, I, to be honest, I've, I've said this on Twitter. I've said this several times. I think that that is going to be one of those hits on Caleros that is in the eye of the beholder. I understand right. why Winnipeg fans look at it and say yeah. that's dirty. I understand why, why Edmonton fans say, come on. Right. Um, it is in my opinion, I cannot in good faith assign intent on that hit. No, um, I just, it's football. When we slow it down and you watch the replay frame by frame, you think it's one thing you watch it full speed. It's happening crazy. He, fast. He, he came across him so fast that you didn't even know he got hit. That's how fast it was. It was, it was like, Oh, he threw the interception away. He threw the ball away and it was intercepted for a touchdown. And you're like, did that just happen? And like, he kind of looked like he was down. And then the replay from behind was like, Oh, he tosses the ball out. And then this guy comes across, hits him in the head and then is flying over. It's, it's, it's one of those ones where it's so bang, bang. And I don't know what the defender was supposed to do, but this reminds me of a <laughs> actual hit on Henry Burris back in 2007 in Hamilton. It was, he was going out of bounds. He was, didn't give himself up. He was like, like running out of bounds. Henry goes out of bounds and then Joan Armour was coming flying across and couldn't stop himself and hit him. Well, turns out Henry separated his shoulder on the play and had to miss the next three weeks. And we were, we actually, funny, it was Wally Bono night in Vancouver last night. Mm-hmm. And uh, Wally the next week, like broke this down frame by frame. And he's like, what is Joan supposed to do on this play? You know, he's, he's actually put his knees in the dirt. And he's trying to slow himself down. He can't do it. It's a hard thing to do when you're flying around. Football is a dangerous game with these gigantic men flying across the field at lightning speeds. It just, sometimes it happens and it's such a split second. I don't know. It's, it's tough. I remember that, that Henry Burris hit and there was a lot of calls for in Calgary for like, Oh, they hit it's up. People it, knocked, knocked, knocked our quarterback out. You ruined our season. Da, 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 da. They were blaming them for losing that game. I'm like, well, you didn't, you weren't even leading in the game anyway. You didn't, anyway, yeah. that's long history ago, but that was 2007. So we're still here, 2023, talking about the same type of thing. It's, it's, it's part of the game. It's, and it, yeah. it, it, I'm not saying that the hit is part of the game. Cause again, I cannot assign intent and I don't, I don't feel like it would be fair. Um, what I know is it, 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 it stinks to see yeah. the, the, MOP and we haven't really seen an update on that yet, have we? No, um, I mean they've they they been should off be back the weekend. tomorrow, right? Yeah, so. Um, because they they do play here in Calgary on Friday. And uh, it, my you, parents will be at that game. Right. May I just very quickly just to go back? Um, since I'm a professional, I did decide to go back and check who was starting. Oh, and, okay. For the Edmonton Elks, um, Nick Arbuckle. Yes, Brooklyn. right. Yes, uh, it was a game that they got absolutely dismantled by the BC Lions. Um, which is sort of and when and at, at that point in time we. We're expecting Arbuckle to have big things, and it turned out Nathan Rourke was the guy then in that game. A hundred percent. Arbuckle, and then um, Trey Ford did come in at right. the end of the second quarter, registered eight passing yards and interception. So, what's wild is it took them a quarter and a half to lose faith in Nick Arbuckle. <laughs> and how many <laughs> losses did they eight, eight games to get? Uh, to give him a chance this year. Yeah, um, it was as bizarre. many people know. It's honest. a bizarre decision. So. Nick is, I consider him a friend. So yeah. I just need to point that out. But look, honestly, I, I sorry, I, I sort of transitioned into a yeah. joke there. It just sucks. I hope Zach's okay. Um, and given... when he's got a history of concussions too, and we don't want to have this to be something that ends his career, right? They need to play it safe. I mean, um, like you, you think back to some of the quarterbacks who had to end their careers for like Dave Dickinson, Matt Dunnigan with concussion problems, and you just hope that's not the, 
the well, case. Look, what we all hope for is Zach gets a clean bill of health yeah. and can safely return to the field for practice this week and is yeah. back playing against the Calgary Stampeders right. on Friday. That's what we want. Um, it's either way, that game was honestly like it probably wasn't as fun as the 38 to 29 score line <laughs> indicates. <laughs> well, it, um, it was because that game was close up until the end. Uh, Winnipeg put up another late touchdown to break it open. Edmonton still had a chance, and I. I'm a degenerate gambler and I bet on the Elks and I bet on the Elks way too often because the odds were huge and I should have cashed the ticket out when they offered it to me when it was 22, nothing, but I didn't do that because I wanted to show everybody that I had faith in the Edmonton Elks to win this game. And of course I don't get that ego boost. So uh, I could have made money, but cashing the ticket out, I didn't anyway. So I was intently watching this game being like, come on Edmonton, prove me right. I had faith in you. I put my money on you. You could have made me a lot of money, but it's all right. I'm not. I'm not bitter I, at all, Danny. I'm not bitter at all. I don't gamble. <laughs> I know you don't. You're if not. You have bitter. a gambling problem. There are a lot of resources out there for you. Um, I don't. Now, have a, I don't have a problem. We are going to move on. <laughs> although I do quickly want to note: sucks that we're not able to watch. Like we need my my laptop screen so that yeah. we can sort of reference. You know, I'm like, stats yeah, and stuff. We, we've been it's a, twenty-eight like, twenty-four for the Argos right now. Devaris Daniels has one hundred and forty-four receiving yards on four catches and two touchdowns. Anyone who knows me knows like Devaris. Basically, my first game covering the Stampeders right. was Devaris's first game for the Stampeders. Oh, so you guys was, grow up together. Uh, you feel that way. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he feels that way, but I feel that way. So I'm just I'm a big Devaris Daniels fan. I also think he's like quietly. If you go back and add up since 2016, yeah, and like you continue. So if a guy retires, then they're they don't. We continue to count their total numbers. I would bet you Devaris Daniels is sort of top three. Since 2016 in CFL receiving, I honestly would. He every he's single been, year gets pretty, between 750 and yeah, 900. He's pretty he consistent. never gets a thousand. It's remarkable. Anyways, good to see him doing that. Um, Montreal Alouettes 41, Saskatchewan Rough Riders 12. Tell me if you agree with this statement. I said in my intro, I think that this is a better win for the Owls and tells us more about the Owls than it is a bad loss for the Riders. Who yeah, were, who played on Sunday, had to travel across the country. And they, they were put in a bad position, and then, then they lost their quarterback too, right? Yep. So, again, you know, you, you got half of game of Mason Fine to see what he was doing. Uh, it, they just started to fall apart, and on that one, yes, the, the the Montreal Alouettes didn't have their starting quarterback, and they did really well. Now, Caleb Evans wasn't asked to do a whole lot. They did a lot of rushing in that game, but it was such a – it was just a, one of those, yep, yeah, that's a neat, tidy win for the Owls, and you – they're starting to look like a team that, okay, they're in control of that second spot in the uh, East Division right now. And, when, and it, it, they're, if they can get Fajardo healthy and just keep moving along, I think they're going to have a good chance. I, I, I think that you have to, regardless of what happens with the Argos and Red Blacks in the back, back half. Like, there are two definitely good teams in the East, and the yeah. Alouettes are the second team. Um, there is no way the Argos can do what they want in the season. If that's the East final, yeah. then, man, that's going to be – that's I'm – I'm going to have trouble picking. I think that's going to be a great game. Yep. There's this whole thing that's like very basic about sports sometimes. And I remember when the Raptors sort of got good and became yeah. a team like they couldn't beat LeBron. But they were good. And I was listening to the Bill Simmons podcast and he was talking about it. And he was like, yeah, it turns out that if you just get good NBA players, you're probably going to have a good NBA team. <laughs> like, like, and, and they, that's well, the thing. They put enough good players on that team, that Montreal team. Right? Exactly. So, and I was impressed with Caleb Evans. Again, I maybe not asked to do much, yeah. but. But again, I'm like, he didn't hurt them that badly and he managed the game. And I'm like, oh, game manager is such a like a negative term for some reason. And how about winning football? That that's all that matters. Exactly. So, and and with the riders, and, again, I he, he was a guy that was just kind of left by the wayside last year in, in Ottawa. And I was like, okay. Um he was to the point where like I'm like, <laughs> should teams be looking to trade for Caleb Evans? Uh, uh, yeah, well. I don't I don't think that the Alouettes would let him go. Um there, there was a trade today in the CFL Antonio Pipkin goes from Hamilton to Saskatchewan. So they're clearly looking at a long-term not having Mason fine available. So uh, not good for that team that, and then everybody who was, who was clamoring for Jake Dolagala, you're going to have him now. So, yeah. And I know a lot of people were, but I mean, ultimately this moves, look, the riders, they lose They're four and five. I think that that loss, you'd feel a lot worse if about if the Stampeders hadn't hadn't completely, I'm trying to think of a term that does not 
force me to swear that says crap the bed basically so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, soil the sheets is yes. that what you're doing? yeah soil the sheets <laughs> but yeah i mean look they're they're four like they're only one game back of 500 they're, yeah they're four and five no I mean, let's let's relax on, on writing them off given that they have been without trevor harris for a month given that they just lost this one given that they had to go do touchdown atlantic yes then i mean they're then fly back across the back across the country i which i they've been doing a lot of traveling doing a lot of traveling and i i hate sunday friday games um yeah and especially when it involves a flight like that like i see what the stampeders i know how i feel like after the labor day back to back and that's a two and a half hour okay. drive to edmonton all the, all the times that we did those when i was covering the team it was monday and friday yeah, and that was the tradition and it was just by, cruel and unusual yeah, and should never but, and the thing is you felt like it was one game because a lot of times you wouldn't even remember oh it's something happening against edmund between edmonton and calgary you're like which one was it was it in the front half or the back half like they're so close together they would they would get they would do their recovery day on tuesday they would do a light workout on wednesday travel up to edmonton on thursday like there was just no. it was just not enough time to recover and the thing is everybody used to say well it's tradition and they used to play they used to play friday and monday we're like no okay that was back in the 60s that was a while ago now you it's like yeah they move finally moved it to saturday but the one thing that we used to be we it was tradition when we would it was the thursday night nfl opener would always be on the on that week so we would end up watching the game the night before the game and it was like I so we were trip. just getting binged on football all week so. i love that trip it's still the yeah it's a great trip it's the way. only trip i'm i think i'm gonna go to edmonton for the labor day replay yes. um i don't i haven't figured out i i don't know if i'm gonna go up a night early or not i probably yeah. will like that would be the fun but like I, yeah. I don't know i'm like i'm living a pretty low-key life so right now so <laughs> i don't know what the point of that would be um okay we have now gone i had we have gone 23 minutes which i am impressed with us right um, i said i didn't want to only make this these stampeders <laughs> uh it's sort of the, the raison d'etre uh, yes. <laughs> for this podcast though so bc lions 37 calgary stampeders nine um i mean <laughs> yeah this was they got the opening kickoff called back there were penalties they on were, the opening drive they there were, were penalties. offside on the opening kickoff yeah and I'm like and i think dave dickinson said it was like hey i gotta get these guys ready to play they weren't even ready to play he was like i, I mean I, I, I didn't i don't know how that happens for one and like they did not understand the importance the of this thing. game or what there's the, like the, 20, the intensity of this like a it was 25 a year old pass in interference Vancouver. call on that opening drive yeah um there are there were so many holding penalties this like honestly i i'm a, like i like it when the stampeders are good i like so many of the guys on this team personally i'm not trying to beat up but like this is the by far in my in my seven years covering the calgary series this is by far the worst that i've seen them play yeah and you, what we said was the worst half of uh, any game in the last seven years, seven, eight years. I uh, like, I don't remember them having a, this bad of a half since the Huffnagle era. Like, and now at three and six, this is their worst start since what, 2004. So yeah, this, like, I don't think that this team is way better than that 2004 team, but this team has and, too much talent for this. That's right. the issue. Like I, and I don't actually want to put it on, on one player. I, you know, people get so mad on Twitter these days, but I, <laughs> I, at one point, X. the TSN guys who I love that Nielsen crew. Like I like, honestly, those guys, I, I love when they're calling stamps games. I think they're so good. And they said like, why is, or the Stampeders like, why is Jake Mayer not taking big shots downfield? You're down 17, nothing right now. Yeah. And all I tweeted and I stand by it is, How's he going to do it when the D line is collapsing? They on were, like that? He had no time to operate. There was at so all. much pressure all game long. And, and we know like, you know, Farhan describes sort of like a, a technical issue that, that Jake has when he's under pressure. I'm not even like saying that. I don't think any quarterback was going to be yeah. able to thrive in that environment. And what Dave said was, he was like, look, I'm actually cool with the way that the running backs played um, the D line. And I particularly think Rose and Wigan um, it's, I think that, Offensive lines are beginning to figure out that, like, since Fodders is out, that there may not be a ton of pressure coming yeah. from the outside on that D line, like the DNs who have other jobs, right? Like Julian yes. Hauser has contained. Like, there's there's oh, yeah. a lot that has to happen there, but I do think that they're able to really focus on double teaming Mike Rose in particular and Derek Brigham. Yeah. They had a good third quarter, and and then Dickinson they, said that the linebackers were good. So he said, other than that, it was not up to snuff, and no. I think we all saw that. I think that the DBs, and I'm not saying all of them. 
but I I'm specifically not naming names here because it's yeah it's not fair for me to do. But like through the middle of that field, Keon Hatcher just getting, getting free light. again and again. Yeah. You talked about Winnipeg making those adjustments in game. Obviously, it's harder to do that against the Lions, but I just didn't I, I just didn't feel like I saw it. And yeah. then well, um, let's let's give Vernon Adams credit too because to. he was he was under pressure, but he managed to move away from it and make things some some things happen and. Every time you, you, he was running around back there, and you're like, "Man, that play took a long time." And then he was like, "Okay, well, he's still he's still out there running around." When he so, gets out of the pocket. I'm just like, "Oh, he's gonna complete it, right?" He's and see, and the other night, like pressure can can disrupt any quarterback, and we saw it in Edmonton game with Edmonton was getting right after Zach Cloros. Mm-hmm. That defensive end was all over him, and it was just like, "Okay, so pressure can work against anybody." It's just sometimes you gotta. The guy has to step up and and handle it, and Vernon Adams did. Hey, Vernon Adams had a great game, and, and I, he was absolutely like firing darts down the middle of the field. Yeah. And so, as much as I'm saying like I didn't like the way that the defensive backfield necessarily was covering middle of the field, there were also a couple of tosses where I was like, "Hey, you, yeah, like, <laughs> like, what are you gonna do?" Like yeah. he was right. He's on amazing. Point. I mean, he's he's in when, the when he's on his when he's on his game, like he's not consistent enough to say he's the best player in the league or anything like that. But when he's on his game, you. you Hard to want anybody else, right? So let's hypothetically say that that the Lions survive. Like let's I and I don't even want to bring in Zach missing time here. Right. If the Lions win the West Division, Vernon Adams will have to be part of the conversation for MOP. A hundred percent. So like just ruling him out as and yes, that it I understand fans saying, Oh, it's always the best of the quarterback on the best team, and it doesn't actually it's like true, but look what Vernon did last night. Yeah. So, like, we're not just saying this by default. But if they win the West, I think that he has to be in the conversation. Right. So you saying, well, he's not the best player in the league. I think he might be in the conversation when he's on his game. Now, but that's what I mean. He's kind of inconsistent in that respect. I don't think this year, other than one bad game against Argos, the Argos, you can say he's inconsistent. I don't. I think he's been remarkably consistent. Yeah. And Maybe. I think last so, year when he took over for Nathan Rourke, he, he put together some wins. Yeah, he did. He came into Calgary and won again, didn't he? Yeah. So, that Yes. I agree with that. It's just the results haven't always been. Actually, he's got a pretty good record outside of, like Farhan was talking about it the other day too, right? Um, and he's he's a winning quarterback. He just needs to stay on the field. Obviously, injuries have hampered his and have this year as well, right? So if they can stay healthy with him and keep moving forward, that's a team, yes, they're going to be in the conversation and they're going to be hosting one of the home playoff games. Uh, that's redundant. They're going to be hosting a playoff game this November and they're going to be a hard team to beat. Um, I am not going to have this right now be a, you know, a, a trial of Jake Mayer. What I want to know is you, as someone who watches the Stampeders against the Argos, we gave them a ton of credit for a conservative game plan yeah. that avoided mistakes. They, they, ca- they did not try to go over the top. They did not try to go deep. That worked in part because the defense had a phenomenal game in part because they got a special teams touchdown. Yeah. Um, and they were able to do so, and it worked. And we said, hey, maybe that's the path going forward. You can't do that when you fall behind. Um, would you like just to see them live with the mistakes? Or, like, I, I think they're you, down. You just have to go for it more, don't you? Well, you have to. Well, yeah, you, you obviously have to live with the mistakes if you're going with a young guy. You've got to push the ball downfield. This is the CFL. You There's no... There's no way you can go four or five yards and a cloud of dust. Like sometimes you want to do that. Now it worked last week when they played Toronto, the run game was going well. I heard a real cold take out of Vancouver of a Vancouver guy. who's was like, Oh, Calgary's offense was terrible last week against Toronto. I'm like, okay. They had 150 yards rushing. Like, no, they, they weren't terrible, but now they'll be proven. This person will be proven correct this week because the Stamps offense was terrible this week. And well, and it's you go from a couple I, weeks I think, ago, Jake throwing for 400 yards and they lose, and everyone's saying, Oh, well, don't do this. Don't like, don't you gotta bring it yeah, in, yeah. you gotta rein it in. And now he's thrown for less than 150 basically for right. two weeks in a row. And people are saying, Oh, well, you gotta be taking the shots. Like, I don't, I don't know right. that it's, I don't know what works. Well, I think, the, I think the Stampeders to. are the best when they are a balanced team. When they're when they're they're rushing and their passing is about equal in the game, they're getting consistency out of both of those ass or facets of the game. That's when they're their best offense. It's when one starts not working and they put too much pressure on the other, and you can start to pile the box. I'm like, okay, so you can tell what's 
yeah. how it's going to go when that happens. You need consistency and in, in balance in, in those things. So they need to fix, they, they need to find out what's going on in their past game and try and fix it. Cause I, I feel like it's just, they got to try and push. They got to be more creative or something. It's something missing there. And I, you can tell <laughs> Dickinson after the game, he was just like, yeah, we're, we're, we got to try some new stuff. Like it's, it's not working. So if he doesn't have the answers, I don't think I'm going to tell him I have any answers. Dickinson was the most like defeated is the wrong word, but he was basically like, guys, I don't, like, he, he we, was, he looked perplexed. And I talked to him today, right? Like there were no cameras. Yeah. There. Um, and he was a little bit like, this is sort of on everybody. We need solutions. We're playing Winnipeg on Friday. So we don't really have time to no. implement a bunch of new things. Um, and he, and everything need, sorry, I just, tap the tap the mic that's going to sound terrible but like in football you need everything to be working you need the o-line to work yes. to give the run game holes to give the quarterback then you need the quarterback to be accurate and, right. and on top of it and going through his reads then you need your receivers to be running the right routes when none of it's happening this is what happens yes um and you know i don't i couldn't give two hoots um God, i don't talk like this i like <laughs> my attempts to be professional <laughs> every time you're trying to be uh pg you come across sounding like ned flanders <laughs> <I know. laughs> um but like chris reynolds comes in throws an interception that's like you're not on the same page as your receiver because you've never actually like who cares yeah um like how many reps I, like how many reps does this chris reynolds get like well it, that's the thing like barely any and tommy stevens had back spasms yes and um that, so. and that was a, like that was a hole that was missing in the game like you could tell that they didn't have that yardage option i mean third they, and two when they tommy stevens is a weapon that they use very well and when they when you don't have them it it causes a problem and they're they, not they turn going, the ball over in in the offensive zone they're not right? going a shotgun passing play if tommy stevens is is available on third yeah. and two um i i will i just will quickly tossed out there ryan valentine did a really nice job um today in his three down roundup just sort of pointing out he's like man how many drives have we seen when the stamps need 20 or 10 or even eight yards and instead of looking downfield they do these uh, sweet uh, under yeah, and, underneath, yeah and the blocking's so. not there and it's not even like they're getting i i find like close to the first downs no um what, what was the receiving yards on the running backs in this game because it felt like it could have been negative yardage yeah i mean carry had two for 14 and then mills had one for six um okay. but it's weird i just yeah, the defense is going to give you those ones because if you need well they were in first and 20 a lot yeah it felt like in that game and i'd like to see the numbers on what actually how many teams score points on on drives where they give up sacks or take holding penalties because if you can there if you were can so over many drives killed by holding penalties yes and it was just like, so you get, if, if you have that happen, you're not going to score points. And the, pers like the best teams will probably have, you know, a tiny percentage of maybe they score 25% of the time when they take a holding penalty or give up a sack. I don't know what the numbers are. It would be something to look up. And this is what I would throw to Steve Daniel if he was, if I was still doing it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's the type of stuff. It was like, and you feel like you feel like Calgary's percentage is basically zero right now. I'm going to search this because I honestly will, will say it's so wrong. Um, but someone tweeted today that Steve Daniels said that CFL, this is from Bob, the Moj Marjana, oh, yeah. um, who was a play by play for the lions. CFL stats guru, Steve Daniel pops into the booth before the game and tells us the 63 point swing. The lions had from winning 27, nothing against Edmonton and then losing 50 to 14, uh, against Winnipeg was the largest swing that he could find in CFL history. Then the Lions went out and won 37 nice, <laughs> which makes it a 64 point swing, which is nail. The oh, highest. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Which is See, this is what I love about Steve. Because who is going like through the entire <laughs> list of every team mm -hmm. to find out what the swings were back and forth, margin of like, and he's he's a stats nerd and he loves football. in the best way. In the best way. Absolutely. No, like the stuff that he would come up with, he just would be like, man oh man and i'm like oh i just want you as my personal stats guy and that's he hey, he, the whole he, stfl he, stats he helped apparatus. me out a lot during my career and i appreciate every time and i every time i email him he'd go i'm at work right now but i really want to look this up yeah. <laughs> um the entire cfl stats apparatus is broken steve daniel is not shout out steve daniel um i want to he just does the in stadium stats now, i want to exit believe, right? with one specific question 
Okay. Um, and then we're going to move on very quickly. Um, we're going to try to wrap all this up in about five minutes. But before we go on and look at the week 11 games, um, I have always said, cool guys, don't stress. Whatever happens in August, <laughs> the Stampeders have back to back games. Against Edmonton. <laughs> yes. What I, I don't like, you know, gambling stuff. So you just, whatever, what are the, like, how, much less confident are you that the stamps will sweep those after this week? Are you still, I I'm a hundred. I was a hundred percent. Now I'm sort of 75. If you're the stamps, you want Edmonton to win before then, because I feel like the, the Edmonton Elks will win their win a game this year. And that's it. They'll probably win one game, maybe two. You don't want to be that team that gives it up and Winnipeg. You could, the one thing was like, they didn't panic when they were down 22, nothing. It was like, ah, we're still going to win this game. It was like, okay. But yes, I have lost a little bit of faith that the Edmonton, that Edmonton is just going to roll over and let Calgary sweep them. And we might actually get a good weeks. Labor Day game we, and or a terrible game with a score that's close. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if it's 16 to 11, we're probably not going to be happy, but Edmonton has Hamilton and Ottawa before. So there's a chance, particularly that Hamilton game. Yeah. That you could see the win that Hamilton games on the road too, which is, actually works out better for them <laughs> who knew <laughs> um we do this every week we're gonna go we got each sort of like well we got 30 seconds uh august 17th which i assume is thursday um <laughs> like cfl connect page doesn't actually tell us that but yes it is thursday okay uh edmonton at hamilton i think this one's kind of hard to predict um i do, i don't know what's going on in hamilton uh that that team's been off this week and they traded a quarterback away so i don't know what's What's the deal? So, uh, who, who, who the bye week complicates it? Yes, because they have been sitting at home. You do you do fix a lot of things during bye week. Calgary Stampeders are excellent off bye weeks. As I this isn't really so. supposed to be like a who do we pick? Like normally, what I do no, is I be like read the games and we say which ones are the most interesting. Yeah. But to be honest, like it's it's, it's, it's clearly like, Winnipeg <laughs> Calgary to us, obviously. But uh, I think we want to see what happens with Zach, and I think that's yeah. the intrigue there. I'm picking. I'm picking Edmonton. Uh, you do have Winnipeg at Calgary again, very hard to predict, but I look, I Calgary's got to sh like the stamps have to show me something. I'm not picking the stamps after last week. I'm no. not, I'm not picking anyone this game. I'm not going to get the players who I know listen to and give me a hard time picking against them. <laughs> I'm not giving them any ammunition. I'm just saying, how am I going to pick the stamps over Winnipeg right now? I can't. So I'm just not going to make a pick going to hang out. Yeah. And that's one of those ones where I'll be making my bet at game time, Bob, probably. Yeah, yeah. Because I right now I'm like I don't know. It it'll depend on health of Zach Claros, but also how this team looks in practice this week. It's, you know, they almost need like a kick in the butt or something, right? And you would always like you could always tell sometimes it was like you know, Huff was the best at it. But sometimes when he he needed to yell and get everyone's attention, that that happened and it got everyone's attention. And Dave's not that kind of guy, but it's it's just. That's what they need right now is a little bit of a kick in the, the rear. Yeah, and it's about execution, and that's yeah. the reality. Um, and they do – look, there's guys on the – I'm not going to make up excuses for them. Um, on Saturday, we have Montreal at Ottawa. Um, I mean, it's hard to pick against Montreal except that right now – Yeah, well, well Dustin, Dustin Crumb looked like he was uh, doing much better uh, tonight, and we're – Recording this while that game is in progress. Oh, Ottawa we're versus Toronto. Turn on the second word I'm recording. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm going. The I'm, reason. I'm running off here <laughs> yeah. to, to go watch this game. <laughs> um, but yeah, so look, I mean that that to be honest, that game is one that actually, given what the way Ottawa's playing Toronto right now, and given that there's not a ton of travel there, that one is just sort of like a must watch a yeah. little bit for me at this point. Um, Montreal, Ottawa are the two teams that are going to be duking it out for feels like second place, uh, or if Ottawa pulls the upset tonight against Toronto, then. Not, not second place maybe like somebody can track down toronto i it's gonna be that the race actually feels intriguing now in the east which it rarely does to me so it's the first time in a long time uh and then bc sask honestly like bc should win this game but it is in it's, it's, in, it's in saskatchewan know. and you're gonna get a full week of getting jake dolgala prepped and ready and saskatchewan rough rider fans that wanted to see him now you get your chance so and he is he just still can. He I can hope whip the, the ball. They they're gonna have to do something about containing that pressure, but that's like 
I hope that the riders win by the exact number of points that makes this the, the biggest swing <laughs> in CFL history. So it's three games in a row. I hope that they shut the Lions out <laughs> by, by uh, uh, yeah, whatever. Wait, it would be. I'm not going to do the math here on air. Uh, um, well, we're not that good at math, even if we had a calculator. So no, um, Buzz, anything you want to plug? Uh, no, I don't think so. Right, I mean, fine. yeah. Um, Anybody, everybody that wants to find me knows where to find me. Well, I mean, I'm. I don't know if that's true, but I so appreciate I'm you coming B- on. B U Z R B E on X. We're not on Twitter. I'm not calling it X. <laughs> I'm not calling it X. When that when the icon changed to a little X, I was like, did some bizarre app just show up on my phone? Again, like- my whole theory is, and I've done it. I did it probably twice, being like, I guess I'm. I guess Twitter's dying. I'm out. And I was like, the reality is, like. It's still it's them the changing tweet deck will change it for me, but it is the exact same experience for me. Right. Yeah. Like it hasn't gotten like for me, like ultimately I think it's bad for the world. Yeah. Um, but as it pertains to me, like I don't know, man. All it is is an icon. I figured it out pretty quick. Well, I it. mean, I heard the stories this weekend that it's roughly lost half of the value since he took over. And like really half your value. And then one of the tags was, Does he still think it was a good investment? No, if something you buy <laughs> loses half its value, it's not a good investment. No. It's supposed to double in value after you buy it. Yikes. Yikes. That's, <laughs> that's how we're going to end this. I do, um, let's cut to the outro. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Guys, let's say you're having a party. Let's say you're having a picnic. Let's say you're having any occasion. We got to talk to you about Fraser and Fig. I love these guys. Here in Marta Loop, a couple storefronts down from our studio here. Fraser and Fig, man, these guys do these delicious elevated cheese and charcuterie boxes. You know, they're made with all these fresh artisanal ingredients, on-demand grazing, pickup, delivery. You got it. Just let them know what you want. They will get it to you. Honestly, I'm such a big fan. I had a picnic a little while ago. I brought one of their curated boxes, and it was a huge hit. I looked great. People loved it. We're hungry. They weren't hungry anymore. These ready-to-go boxes, they got them in four sizes. All their boxes come with meat, cheese, dried fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, and carrots. Their selections vary from month to month. Choices are always new. You know, just because they've had one doesn't mean you've had them all. I love Fraser and Fig. I love having them as a sponsor. They're the best. Make sure you check them out. Tell them by from the 55 sent you. All right. That was Ian Busby, my friend and yours. We try to have him on as often as possible. He's a guy who brings a perspective that goes well before my time covering this league and covering the Calgary St. Peters. And I'm so appreciative of him. Appreciate I'm appreciative of you, my listeners, um, as well. Speaking of which, I was asked, now that I'm looking at it, uh, by by someone on Twitter to explain what happened to Andrew Harris's arm. Uh, I got a little bobblehead here for people on the listen on the who are listening. Um, I don't have a really a good story. I, I wish I did. I when we were kind of getting the studio ready, and it's still not. We're we're still not done decorating. We're gonna get some stuff on the walls, um, which is what I have for now. But yeah, just honestly, when I was moving it, I had a full Andrew Harris. Now I don't. But you know, gotta have. And I know it's bobblehead doll. Why not? We're we're a CFL podcast, not just Calgary. But yeah, um, I don't know. I wish I had Andrew Harris's arm. I miss his arm. I'm sure he misses it. But you know, he was given a great stiff arm at the time, and that's that. So, anyways, guys, we're gonna be back on Thursday. Um, big episode. It is. It is Stampede Eaters. I don't know why I said Stampede Eaters like that, but Stampeders Legacy Night. Um, so I've got a receiver from that '98. Great cup team. Vince Danielson, he's going to be on. Can't wait to talk to him. That'll be super fun walking down memory lane, a little bit different. And, uh, you know, I'm good buddies with the Winnipeg guys, so we got to preview that game, talk about what's going around in the league. But for now, thank you to you for listening. Please pass it on if you enjoy the podcast. Also, thank you, of course, to Fraser and Fig and Mugs Pub, our sponsors. We love them. Um, Yeah, that's kind of it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this weekend's games. Hope we see more of Nathan Rourke this week. Have a good one. Cheers.